Hey, it's Paul from One Cast One Fish, and today I'm bringing you class number five on the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. Now, class number five is going to be a continuation of class number four, where we're going to be covering more of the Garmin Striker sonar features. So, if you haven't already, be sure to check out the other classes in this series. In today's class, we're going to be looking at how to adjust our range zoom, gain, and we're going to look at our sonar frequency selections. I'm also going to be showing you a trick on how to pause your sonar. Now throughout this video I'm going to be referencing other videos I've done in the past that are full of great supplemental information. From the home screen, scroll down and select traditional sonar. This will bring us to the traditional sonar screen. Now let's press the menu key. This will bring up the menu options for the traditional sonar screen. Here you have the ability to adjust and change settings for your range, gain, frequency, zoom, overlay numbers, and sonar setup. Now for this class we'll be covering range, gain, frequency, and zoom as we looked at sonar setup and overlay numbers in class number four. The first feature we're going to discuss is range. From the traditional sonar menu, scroll down and select range. Here you can adjust the range of the depth scale that appears on the right side of your screen. You can either set your depth range manually or allow the fish finder to automatically adjust the range by selecting auto range. I rarely ever adjust my depth range manually because in my opinion it's just way too much work to consistently adjust the depth range as the bottom contours change consistently. And without proper adjustment, it can lead to issues like this with your sonar image. In my opinion, the Garmin Striker does a pretty good job of adjusting the depth range when in auto. And automatic ranging keeps the bottom within the lower third of the sonar screen, which means you can spend more time fishing and less time messing with your fish finder. The next feature I'm going to talk about is the zoom feature. From the traditional sonar screen, press the menu key to bring up the menu options for the traditional sonar. Now scroll down and select zoom. Here you'll see you have a few options for zooming in on your sonar screen. No zoom, bottom lock, manual, auto, and split zoom. Let's start by scrolling down and selecting bottom lock. Bottom lock is going to lock the screen to the bottom based on your depth selection. However, it's only going to show that depth range. And again, in my opinion, without consistent adjustment, this zoom option can be prone to display issues on your sonar screen. Back at our zoom menu, scroll down and select manual. With the manual zoom selection, you have the options to adjust the zoom and depth. Now as we adjust our zoom, you'll notice the box on the right hand of the screen changes size to represent the area of your zoom. And adjusting your depth will move your zoom box within the water column. Back at our zoom menu, Let's scroll down and select auto. Now with auto zoom, again, you have the ability to change your zoom window size, but the biggest issue with the auto zoom is that it uses the bottom as the starting point for your zoom. So again, your zoom is always locked to the bottom. This can be great if the majority of what you want to view is located near the bottom, but this isn't always the case. Back at our zoom menu, scroll down and select split zoom and turn it on. With the split zoom, the screen will be divided in half, with one half displaying the traditional sonar and the other side showing the zoomed view. If you look at the non-zoom side, you'll see that the zoom window can be adjusted in size and depth. And as our zoom window is adjusted, we'll notice that our zoomed area on the left of the display screen also changes. My biggest piece of advice when using the zoom feature is don't go overboard. A little bit of zoom actually goes a long way, and if you zoom too much, you may actually have the opposite effect to make things harder to interpret or see. Now I'm going to show you a feature that I do use quite often, and that's how to pause your sonar screen. This is extremely useful when you want to pause your sonar screen to get a better look at the targets or structure that you see in the water column. I'm also going to show you a cool trick on how to mark waypoints from a paused sonar screen. Pausing the sonar is actually very easy. From the traditional sonar view, simply press the left or right arrow on the arrow keypad to pause the current sonar view. Pausing the sonar gives you a chance to interpret the sonar images without the sonar screen moving, which in turn gives you a bit more time to look at and accurately interpret what you're seeing on your screen. Here's another really cool trick when you pause your sonar. You can use the arrow keypad to cursor over any piece of structure you see on your screen. Now simply press the waypoint key and now you've accurately marked that exact piece of structure on your waypoint map. The next feature we look at can have a huge impact on what you see or don't see on your sonar screen. And that's the gain adjustment. Having a good understanding of your gain adjustments is very important. And that's because gain adjustment can be a double-edged sword. Too much gain may show more detail, However, it may introduce more clutter and noise. Too low of gain, you may get rid of all that noise and clutter, but now you may be missing fish. So adjusting your gain is a little bit of a balancing act based on the water conditions where you fish. From the traditional sonar screen, let's press the menu key. This brings up our menu options for the traditional sonar screen. From here, scroll down and select gain. Here you'll see your current gain setting selection, which in our case is currently set to auto medium. We can also use our arrow keypad to manually select our desired sonar gain from zero to 100. 
and we can easily set our gain back to an auto selection by simply selecting enable auto gain, which will then allow us to select between auto low, auto medium, and auto high gain. So what's the difference between manually setting your gain or using one of the auto gain selections? Auto gain allows the fish finder to automatically select what it feels is the best gain setting within a desired band, either low, medium, or high. With the auto gain feature, the fish finder constantly will be adjusting the sonar gain within that selected band to show the most detailed returns and least amount of clutter. In general, I find that the Garmin Striker does a great job of adjusting the sonar gain in the auto modes. However, there are specific situations, such as vertical jigging, or for those of us who want to fine-tune our sonar gains, we also have the manual gain option. The manual gain setting will allow you to adjust your sonar gain in increments of 1, from 0 to 100. Manually setting your gain will allow you to fine-tune your sonar for your specific water conditions. And I also find it very useful when vertical jigging. I choose manual gain settings for when I'm vertical jigging, for consistency. And that's because in auto, the fish finder is going to be continually adjusting the gain based on current conditions. And sometimes it might adjust the gain to a point where you lose your jig on your screen. Now I'm going to give you a few tips for adjusting your sonar gain to help you get the best image quality possible. Now what I'm going to show you aren't steadfast rules, but they're a great starting point to help you find the ideal gain settings for your water conditions. <music> I hope this helps shed a little bit of light on how to adjust the gain on your sonar. Our next discussion topic is going to be frequency. The frequency you select is going to impact the angle and overall diameter of your sonar cone. Now if you want to learn more about sonar frequency and sonar cone angles, be sure to check out the supplemental videos that I'll link to down in the description as they go in depth on sonar frequency and cone angles for the Garmin Striker. From the traditional sonar screen, press the menu key to bring up the menu options for the traditional sonar screen. Now let's scroll down and select frequency. Here you'll see we have a few options for frequency selection. 77,000 hertz chirp, 200,000 hertz chirp, standard 77,000 hertz, and a standard 200,000 hertz. First I'm going to discuss the difference between the 77 and 200 kHz frequency selections. In the case of the Garmin Striker, the 77 kHz frequency cone angle is about 45 degrees, while the 200 kHz frequency cone angle is roughly 15 degrees. So how does that translate to actual fishing scenarios? Well, one of the most frequently asked questions I get is how much area is my sonar cone covering at any given time? And the answer is directly related to what frequency selection you choose. Now let's look at an example of fishing in 30 feet of water with the 77 kHz frequency selection. At 30 feet, our sonar cone will be covering an area of about 25 feet in diameter. However, since our sonar is a cone, our coverage is actually only about 16.6 .6 feet at 20 feet of water and roughly 8.3 feet and 10 feet of water. Now let's look at how that compares to the 200 kHz frequency selection. At 30 feet of water, our sonar cone will be covering an area of about 8 feet in diameter. However, again, since our sonar is a cone, our coverage is actually only about 5.2 feet and 20 feet of water and our sonar cone only covers about 2.6 feet and 10 feet of water. So how do you know which frequency selection is right for you? The higher frequencies use narrow beam widths, which tend to be better for high speed operation or rough sea conditions. Bottom definition and thermocline definition can also be better when using a higher frequency. Lower frequencies use a wider beam width, which can actually let you see more targets in the water, but it can also generate more surface noise and reduce some bottom signal continuity, especially during rough seas. Wider beam widths also perform better in deep water because the lower frequency has better deep water penetration. Now let's take a look at the chirp frequency selections. The chirp sonar selection differs from single frequency selection in one major way. While single frequency selections saturate the water column with pulses in one frequency band, chirp sonar selections use multiple bands at the same time. The end result is better target separation and clearer sonar images. When using the 77kHz or 200kHz chirp frequency selections, our sonar cone angles do not change on the Garmin Striker. The 77kHz chirp frequency cone angle is still about 45 degrees, while the 200kHz chirp frequency cone angle is still about 15 degrees. The only difference is that the chirp selections use a band of frequencies versus a single frequency. With the standard transducer, the 77 kHz chirp frequency will cover the 77 kHz frequency band, plus or minus 5 kHz, which means the 77 kHz chirp selection will sweep frequencies between 72 kHz and 82 kHz, while the 200 kHz chirp frequency selection will cover the 200 kHz frequency band, plus or minus about 5 kHz. This means the 200 kHz chirp frequency selection will sweep frequencies from 195 kHz to 205 kHz. As you can see, the chirp sonar frequency selection definitely puts more energy into the water comp, which will help you get better target separation and clearer sonar images. 
Now if you really want to up your chirp sonar game and learn more about the Garmin Striker chirp sonar and additional chirp transducer options, be sure to check out my video on chirp sonar that I'll leave a link to down in the description. All right, that's a wrap for class number five. Don't forget to check out the supplemental videos down in the description. And if you have any questions, don't forget to reach out in the comment section down below. Be sure to hit that like button and share with all your friends and we'll see you next time on the water.